I'm KT McFarland. Welcome to DEFCON 3. The situation in Ukraine continues to escalate. Um, we now see violence in the cities of eastern Ukraine. Some people feel that Ukraine is headed for a civil war within a matter of hours. Joining us now is Robert Zarati. He's from the Foreign Policy Initiative. He's the policy director at FPI. And we wanted to ask you, what is your sense of where we are now and where we're going within the next several days? KT, thanks for having me on. You know, we, we really are reaching a tipping point uh, in Ukraine. What we've seen over the last few days is uh, troops not wearing the insignia of the Russian Federation, supporting pro-Russian militants in eastern Ukraine. And these militants uh, have seized government buildings in eastern Ukraine. And in response, we've seen the Ukrainian interim government, Kiev, use commando and police forces in an attempt to try to repel back these, these pro-Russian militants. But the worry here is that the Russian military and Vladimir Putin himself may use this escalating situation as a pretext to send the 40,000 to 100,000 troops that are along uh, Ukraine's border in Russia and to for actually militarily invade eastern Ukraine. And if that happens, we, it will be a huge tragedy, a repeat of what we saw in Crimea uh, just a few months ago. Well, I think you made a really good point that what's, so far what's happened is the Russian has, Russians have troops in there, but they're not wearing Russian uniforms, so the Russians can say, well, they're not really our troops. Those are just Ukrainians who are protesting. The Ukrainian government has used its police force, but so far has not called up its army to go fight these unmarked Russian troops. If the Ukrainians do and you have fighting where you actually have the tanks come in across the border like you're saying and Ukrainian military fighting this is a war that Ukraine doesn't win is it no Ukraine uh, the Ukrainian military can't in a, in a fair fight uh, stand up to the Russian military though of course there there are lots of vulnerabilities that the Russians have they rely on the pipelines running through Ukraine and if those were attacked and, and uh, disabled, that would actually hurt Russia's uh, economy and oil sectors really, really bad. You know, some people have said, well, we should have economic sanctions. Um, the United States has had these very minor sanctions and has talked about doing further sanctions, but really hasn't done them. But interestingly, the Europeans haven't gone along with anything either. And the European economy is much more dependent on the Russian economy. Uh, and it goes both ways. Like you said, Russian gas gets sold to Europe. European goods get sold to Russia. Um, the United States, even if we wanted to do something more serious economically, we're not in a position to do so because our trade is so insignificant. Why won't the Europeans do anything? Well, I think part of it is is that Russian uh, Russia and Euro European economies are integrated. Uh, but a big part of it is just, I think, a, a lack of political will that we're seeing in Europe. You know, they, they, they kind of want the situation to go away, but the problem is, like a bully, if you don't stand up to a bully, the bully only gets emboldened. And, and, we, and the yeah. worry is that this could spread to, you know, not just Ukraine, mm -hmm. which is not formally a part of NATO, but this sort of violent uh, aggression could spread to, Ukrainian, uh, to, to NATO member states. Well, then what happens? All right, so let's flash forward. Russia takes part of eastern Ukraine, gets away with it. Do the Russian troops keep moving? Do they move up on the border? Do they move north? Do they move on the other side of the Baltic states, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, which, as you point mm -hmm. out, are NATO members? Are we looking at potentially a conflict between Russia and NATO? It, it already is a, a de facto conflict between Russia and NATO. It's just that we're not acting like it is. But yes, if, if that were to happen and if, if Russia were to set its sights on the Baltic states, uh, this would call a, into uh, action um, Article 5 of, of the, the NATO treaty. And in, the United States and other European members would have to take very seriously the question of how, did, how would they collectively defend our NATO allies in the Baltics? What, what other leverage do we have? Um, you, I think most analysts in the United States, most politicians, certainly in the White House, have said we're not going to use the American military option in Ukraine. They've left open what we might do if it was a NATO country that was attacked. But are there any economic steps we could take that make a difference for Ukraine right now? Sure. Well, you know, what's, what's, what's problematic and in retrospect tragic is that the president was so quick to say that there is absolutely no military option in Ukraine. We could have done lower level things such as sending advisors, um, providing more timely intelligence. In fact, um, several members just recently came of the Congress just came back mm -hmm. from Ukraine and, and 
told the world that we're not actually sharing even just basic tactical intelligence about the location disposition of Russian forces with the Ukrainians. So right now, you know, you, Ukraine is in a very hamstring situation. Uh, but looking ahead, you know, in the, in the, in the near term, I don't know there's all that much we, we can do if we're not willing to, to really act tough. Over the long term, we need to think of this as a long game and think strategically. And a big part of that is weaning our European friends off of their energy dependence with Russia. This means building new pipelines, such as the, the, the Nabucco pipeline that was supposed to have run from Turkey to Austria. Uh, this means exporting more U.S. origin liquid natural gas and other sources of energy. And so, you know, if, if this is the game that Putin wants to run the long game, we have to be willing to compete in that same game over the long term. You know, you're a big picture guy at the Foreign Policy Initiative. What, what signal does this send? You know, we've drawn these red lines. We've said there are going to be serious consequences. There haven't been any, and Putin continues to move. But if you're the leadership in Iran or North Korea or China or, you know, pick your country, what, what lessons sure. are you drawing from this? I think what, what you're learning is that uh, the United States isn't uh, really willing to stand up and, 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 and in a fight. Uh, you know, whether you're looking, talking about Bashar al-Assad's use of chemical weapons, uh, the possibility of Chinese aggression in the South China Seas or the East China Seas, this is, this is a currently a, a United States that's not willing to, to use its military might as a deterrent to prevent such uh, foreign military adventurism. And, and I think it is sending a, worry, uh, sending a worrisome signal, not just to our uh, potential adversaries, but also to our friends. I was in Japan in November uh, meeting with uh, high-level officials in the Abe government, and one of the first questions I got consistently asked was, what happened in Syria? Because they see uh, a, a president who, who has drawn red lines and isn't willing to enforce them. That sends a terrible message throughout the world, KT. Well, stay tuned, because the, that crisis could be next. Thank you so much for joining us, Robert Zarati of the Foreign Policy Initiative. And that's Thank it for DEFCON 3.